Um, good morning, I'm Hale Spangieri, the director of the, with this program at the Wilson Center. We are delighted to um, have you all here and very happy to host this uh, panel on Obama and the two-state solution and Israeli, Palestinian, and an Egyptian perspective. Um, you have uh, bios of our uh, speakers, so we will not get into <coughs> detail in production. Uh, my colleague, Aaron David Miller, is going to uh, chair the session. Um, I must say that, as a change, all of our speakers have either spent time at the Wilson Center or have spoken here before. Um, special welcome to Ziad, Martin, and of course, Samir and Aaron are at home here now. Aaron, you have the floor. Thank you, Holly. Good morning and, and welcome to the Wilson Center and thank you all for coming. I think it's fair to say that the election of Barack Obama, uh, a young and potentially transformative American president, has raised expectations across the board, not only with regard to American strategy uh, on the economy, health care, energy, climate change, but it's also had a rather electric and transformative effect on the prospects of change and solutions to some of the more knotty and intractable problems that America faces abroad. I guess you could divide uh, the first five or six months of the Obama administration into what I would call a preparatory phase, which lasted from his inauguration probably up until the Cairo speech, in which he's done a fairly significant consequential job of altering the software, that is to say, how America approaches the region and what it says about it. This came to a, a, a rather remarkable um, sort of um, um, high point in, with the President's remarks in Cairo. Uh, the question now, of course, is not so much about the software with respect to American policy, but the hardware. What exactly, what is precisely the administration going to do about the number of problems that it confronts, particularly one of the mo more knotty and most politically resonant, which is the Arab-Israeli problem? And it seems to me that the administration is pulled by two competing e and equally compelling realities. The first reality is that there's a real sense of urgency, a sense that if progress is not made, uh, that an unresolved Arab-Israeli conflict will continue to feed the forces of despair, hopelessness, radicalization, that it will feed into America's adversaries and weaken its friends, and that Barack Obama, one-term, two-term president, may be the last president on whose term, on whose watch, arguably, there may be a two-state solution to the Arab-Israeli conflict. So that's the first reality. It's very compelling, it's very urgent, and it resonates everywhere. Second reality, I would argue, is equally compelling, and that is if you looked honestly and soberly at the prospects for achieving a conflict-ending solution to the Israeli-Palestinian problem, in which the current Palestinian and Israeli leadership would conclusively resolve the four core issues that drive this conflict, Jerusalem border security and refugees, even the most idealized and upbeat and optimistic among us would at a minimum have to conclude that this is going to be very, very hard. There are some, I won't put myself in that category quite yet, who reach the conclusion that a, a conflict any solution may not be possible. But that's the second reality that is pulling at the administration. So you have the yes we can, which is Barack Obama's campaign slogan, on one hand, and you have the no you won't, which is the region's response, or at least part of the region's response, to the whole issue of a two-state solution. Today we're going to take a look at the second reality. Uh, I think it's extremely important. It, it's sobering. It may or may not be um, hopeful, depending on what our three speakers have to say, but it's important to look at <coughs> the domestic <coughs> political constraints, the perceptions of the parties, as they approach, each in their own way, uh, the yes we can. And I, I would say that there are no three people who are better able and equipped to do this than uh, Ziad, Martin, and, and Sommer. Each knows the region well. Each knows American policy well. Uh, they, they've been around, and they've watched very carefully. Um, 
for quite a while. So I'm going to ask each of our three speakers to spend the bulk of their 15 minutes, beginning with um, Ziad, then Martin, then Summer, um, assessing the perspectives of the Palestinians, the Israelis, and the Egyptians. And then perhaps at the end of their 15 minutes, to talk a little bit about what their respective parties want, expect, and desire from the administration. I'll have a comment or two to add myself, and then we will go directly and quickly to your questions. Hala, I know you, need, you want to add something. Yeah. Okay. I just want I forgot to ask you please to close your cell phones uh, because it's disruptive and it interferes with, with our live uh, uh, webcast. And also I would like to welcome the chairman of our board, Ambassador Joseph Gildenhorn, and this is part of the forum that Ambassador and Mrs. Gildenhorn have been sponsoring for the last five years. Thank um, you, Joe. It's good to see you. Ziad. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Haile, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with this uh, distinguished panelist group and a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I have the, the uh, unwelcome task, really, of being the first to speak and set a tone that will be challenged severely, I'm afraid, by, by so many. But I will take my chances. So. Uh, uh, first off, I would like to start out with a concept. Uh, the concept is what is called the status quo in the Middle East. The status quo in the Middle East is, is not a plateau. It has not been an even plateau for a long time. It is rather a downhill slope. So every time we analyze a, a, an issue or an action or a perception or a recommendation, we have to keep that in mind. What is the impact of, of that? on the status quo. The status quo being a declining situation leading to further conflicts and potential catastrophic and perhaps really cataclysmic events if, if uh, the status quo is not checked and improved would, uh, should make us all ponder and should help reasonable people to accept compromises that uh, some have called painful compromises that would be much preferable to the other outcome if, if the issue is unsolved and remains to be so. Uh, the old thing about the Middle East was very simple. The old thing was very tribal, very religious-based, race-based, Jews versus Arabs or Muslims, Palestinians versus Israelis, etc., etc. Uh, it has crystallized, of course, in 1948 as a defining identity for all, for the two major uh, parties to the conflict, and remains so for a long time, and still is highly operative and defines the actions and motivations of many people, a simple tribal religious affiliation. Uh, the 67 war and beyond has started a new dynamic that uh, perhaps in, in part re-modified the parties to the conflict to uh, reflect a, n a new approach, which is rather than a tribal religious approach, it is a future-looking approach which essentially says, what goal do we agree on? Uh, there are people who have accepted 1948 and its consequences in its entirety. This is what happened winners, losers, etc., but with a defined <coughs> outcome, and people who have not, not up till this moment. Uh, and, and, and these people who fall into these categories fall actually in, on both sides. There are Arabs, Jews, Israelis, Americans, Muslims, Palestinians, Egyptians on this one side who have accepted 48 and exactly the same distribution of the tribal affiliates on the other side. Uh, so far, the old think has had the power to thwart and veto any possible resolution of the conflict that would by necessity have to be fa based on a, not a zero-sum game, not a winner-take-all and loser-take-all, but on a compromise. The compromise, by definition, is the two-state solution. Uh, 
one of the most experienced American diplomats who sits with me at this table now has experienced the degree of frustration that the, the old think has been able to prevent a reconciliation around the very concept of compromise to the point where he probably by now is, is one of the hardest people to, 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 to induce to any optimistic assessment of the potential for the future. And many people who are experienced with that reach the same conclusion. The unfortunate thing about that conclusion is the aforementioned status quo. If we do not move along these lines and pay the price in, 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 in painful compromise, we will indeed end up with a, with a disaster of the first magnitude. This, the two-state solution has been the official uh, policy of the United States for some time now, certainly very well articulated clearly by the last president uh, on many levels and, and, and adopted internationally in the quartet, which is the international consensus the United Nations and everybody else. Uh, the wall did not move forward very much, even though the policy was in place. To my mind, the right policy still is the right policy, the two-state solution, because all the other options are ridiculous, and the only serious option is chaos and religious metamorphosis of the conflict into a holy war. So politics did subvert policy. Did veto policy and stymie it during the last administration and the same applies to Palestinian politics and Israeli politics and Arab politics. What is significant about the Obama approach that I find very useful other than this, this idea that you know two-state solution is necessary for American-based diagnosis of what the new political landscape in the Middle East is about, the new challenges, and how do you face them. It is, I believe, the, this administration's sense that you need to tidy up the region along you know, these new realities that, uh, that pose new threats to the American interest that are based essentially around the, uh, uh, defining the, uh, the, the party that is not uh, uh, friendly to the United States with the folks around Iran and its proxies, and to create a coalition in the Middle East of folks who would stand up to that challenge and then apply enough pressure on Iran to back off from the, the new system or otherwise devise new policies. This is where the Palestine-Israel fits in. And uh, moving it along would make it possible for Arab leaders to go along with some kind of an alliance coalition that includes Israel without losing their, 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 their rule, their government. You cannot, you cannot get into an alliance with Israel to oppose an Islamic country and expect to survive as a head of state or a regime in the Arab world. So it is important to make progress on the Palestine issue. And hence, we need to take full advantage of that possibility that we, we do have an incentive to, to encourage many parties, the Israelis, Palestinians, and Arabs, to get together because of a, a new regional threat. The, uh, the Palestinian leadership, and I, wa I want to, you know, I think speak more about the Palestinian issue here uh, uh, in particular because uh, uh, it's been contentious and uh, others will address the other issues. The Palestinian leadership has been fragmented for a long time. There was always the nationalist leadership challenged by the left in, in the past, Popular Front and, 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 and more extremist others, other parties. And more recently, the same kind of line of uh, nationalist Palestinian leadership was challenged by the new Islamic uh, uh, opposition. This eventually <laughs> led to the, uh, to the Fatah Gaza split, the Fatah uh, uh, Hamas split, and geographically, of course, with a new a reality, political reality, where Gaza is actually ruled by Hamas and the rest of the, the Palestinian uh, West Bank uh, and territories are, a, are ruled by uh, Fatah or the PA. Uh, this is this very disunity, this very split that the Palestinians have uh, uh, had in the past has been used against them and against their interests in perpetuating the old argument that there is no Palestinian partner. 
it was it was uh, Abu uh, it was Yasser Arafat in the past, and and uh, then uh, Abu Mazen, uh, uh, when he took over, was accused of being weak as a non-partner. He cannot deliver, and with the recent split, he's even more. Uh, weakened, it's perceived to be, why would I negotiate with him since he cannot deliver and he is not a partner. So the, th the constant here is the absence of a Palestinian partner. Uh, if I were uh, interested in a, in a solution to this problem, I would do everything within my power to create an empowered Palestinian partner. If there is no partner, let's let's go around finding a partner, a Palestinian patriot who really is interested in creating a state of Palestine and who is able to deliver. I think we do uh, have to admit that too many entities have helped weaken the present Palestinian leadership to the point to then come to argue and say they're too weak to deliver. You cannot have a Palestinian leadership uh, sustain its position of leadership if it does not deliver for its constituents what they need. They need many things. Above all, they need a political achievement that leads them to a state. They absolutely have to deliver something political. They need security, and they have been working on security, and I think this is now acknowledged by everybody that there's been serious progress made on security, and they need economic improvement, which is hampered in, in, in serious ways by the Israeli occupation. So if you want to have a leadership that you can negotiate with, you cannot go around weakening it. And if you do weaken it, then it is not credible that you are really looking for a, a solution and, uh, and a strong Palestinian leadership. What I like about what uh, uh, the new president has done is that he has addressed the two major interest for the United States in the region. One, one is, is, uh, is facing the regional challenge and then placing this Palestine-Israel where I think it should appropriately be placed. You need to deal with it if you want to create something. So the way he went about it is started, he started talking about addressing the concerns of the Arabs and Muslims and the Palestinians. This started right from the first phone call he made was to Abu Mazen. That's an empowering thing. M many things have happened as uh, Ar uh, Aaron uh, outlined and, and, and we don't need to repeat that. But all the cumulative effect of addressing the Arab and Muslim world and dealing with two issues. Respect, respect, I repeat, and interest. One of the major problems as we stated standing in the way of moving forward was the issue of politics, opposing policy. You cannot make compromises if you feel put upon, if you feel victimized, and if every evidence that you feel every day points to the fact that you're victimized, and you're not respected, and you're not appreciated, and you are not on par with the rest of the human race. This is something that the optics of the present administration has been very helpful in, 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 in paying due respect to the people that, that 1.3, 1.4 billion people on earth who need to have a measure that there is no racist sentiment in the West, especially in the United States against them. And that would make the, 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 the politics easier to deal with. The other issue is one of interest, simply is the United States interest. Frankly, the United States is facing too many challenges, two wars and economic problems, et cetera, et cetera. It can hardly go on you know, uh, pretending like like uh, it has no problems. But on the other hand, <coughs> it continues to be the indispensable party to the resolution of any conflict. You do not resolve any conflict if you do not have the United States lead it and deal with it. And, and it has, you know, people who think that the days of the United States are over are, are smoking something. There is, there is a great future for the United States and there is great power to be used by the United States and its president, its president. And I think, he is doing that. Now, I, 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 I think that there is no doubt that the challenges are great and the major issues outlined are not going to be resolved right away. There is no expectation that they will be resolved right away. And the issues have been defined and negotiated and the gap still remains. 
but uh, there is no military solution. So what does that mean? That means the solution has to come through negotiations. There is no conflict that goes unended forever. There's no such thing. The hundred year war lasted for a hundred years. So negotiations is the only way to do it. That is rationally, except if we all go crazy, which I hope we do not. So we need to negotiate. And we need to negotiate at the core with three parties. Palestinian Israelis and the United States. It is for that reason that you need the Arabs to be part of the conversation. Uh, when I say the Arabs, I mean particularly two countries, in fact, with all due respect to others. One is Egypt, and we'll hear about that, and the other is Saudi Arabia. They have negotiating power to contribute on the economic level, on the leadership level, and on the political impact and oil, frankly. So to have them part of the, of the solution is very, very important. That is, again, the issue of dignity, where it was exceptionally relevant that uh, Obama visit Saudi Arabia and then Egypt. The, the uh, Palestinian internal dynamics are complicated, to say the least. Even the Ramallah system is, is, is not unified. People come to the to the Palestinians and tell them, you must unite. You have to unite. That's the only way to be powerful. That's the only way anybody will accept the, to negotiate with you, and that's the only way to deliver. These people especially include their, pub their public and the Arabs, including Egypt and Saudi Arabia. On the other hand, the United States and Israel simply tell them this. If you unite, forget about dealing with us. There is no Israeli, there is no American uh, 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 party to the to any negotiation with anything that has to do with Hamas. And this is not just a theoretical problem for the Palestinians, it's a very practical problem. For your own information, <coughs> the last two months, <coughs> pardon me, the last two months the Palestinians uh, were denied any money whatsoever. You've heard about pledges, seven billion dollar this and that to, to, to pay, to make good things happen to the Palestinians. The last two months, there was not any money delivered to the Palestinians to pay their salaries, <laughs> the salaries of the employees. And the, the Palestinian government, in the person of Salam Fayyad, the prime minister, had to go to commercial banks in Palestine and sign, I don't know what his credit was, to borrow money to pay salaries for the employees. This is the price for uh, uh, this unity imposed by essentially the Arab donors. The price for you, for for the unity government uh, that the West insists upon was unbearable to the Palestinians. And of course, the other price we, we talked about, uh, not to, to be ostracized by the United States. This cannot be sustained. This cannot be sustained. It is possible, of course, for the Palestinians to fail, as it would be possible right now for the Israeli, for, for, for the Israeli government to make the president of the United States fail. Now that he has gone, you know, on his, you know, high horse and asked for for specific things, the specific things that he asked for are crucial, in my opinion. The settlement freeze. There are many people who oppose the settlement freeze and think it is ridiculous and symbolic and doesn't mean anything in effect. But it is the single most important political delivery that anybody can give to the Palestinian leadership to make it have the legitimacy to stay in power, that it actually does deliver something to its people, to its constituency, through negotiations and not through fighting. And secondly, it does put the acknowledgement to a lasting effect now for all to see that, in fact, there is a limit to the Israeli desire to expand, land grab and all that. It is significant. And, and, and I think one of the most encouraging things, frankly, that have happened when Netanyahu came to this town was when he talked to the President of the United States, they discussed many things, including Iran, where, where I believe they had more agreements than they, they let out. You know. And, and on, on the Palestine issue, the President of the United States asked for a settlement freeze, for, for which Netanyahu said, I really have no, no policy, no, no practical way of delivering this. I have a problem with it. So the idea was, okay, 
go home and see what you can do about it. I'm not going to get involved in your political problems. But more importantly, something happened at the Congress where Mr. Netanyahu met with the congressional leaders of all sorts, and many of them are familiar and, and old, solid friends of Israel, and especially the Jewish leadership of the Congress delivered to Mr. Netanyahu a message that was really unusual, which is, get on the bandwagon here, get on the band, on the two states, it's, it's ridiculous for Israel to oppose a two-state solution. It's an international consensus now. The second is settlement freeze, settlement freeze. He heard that from Jewish leaders in the Congress. And because they understand the political landscape that surrounds Israel, the existential threat that comes to Israel in the future, and they understand the political significance as it applies to empowering the Palestinian leadership. And uh, it, is, it is up to Mr. Netanyahu and his leadership now to come up with the with the solution that would keep this president from failing on this issue, which is, or have a confrontation with the Israeli government that nobody wants. Uh, I have a minute or two, or? Mm, uh, not really. Not really, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, I, I do have, I have, I hope I have uh, a chance to, to, to uh, answer some questions. I wanna say one thing about Hamas. I do agree with the policy of uh, the, uh, President of the United States and with the Palestinian uh, leadership's uh, policy that Hamas should be included in the Palestinian political system as soon as it agrees to the political com to co commitments that the PLO made and to be a party to the political process. It is, it is hard to see how Hamas can be helpful as long as it in the political process as long as it holds arms and is, is practicing violence and is now even challenging the leadership in the West Bank while it's asserting its full leadership in, in, the w in, in Gaza. I see that this is, a, this is what is actually happening and I think it will last for some time, but Gaza has no independent future. Israel has already left Gaza, Egypt does not want Gaza and we'll hear about that. So Gaza will eventually be part of the Palestinian system and we have to negotiate our way through it in the future. Thank you very much. Martin. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Aaron. Good morning to you all. It's always a pleasure to be back in this building uh, where I once indeed did lots of productive work. In fact, I did lots of productive work in the castle too. Uh, so it goes a long way back. Um, uh, this is the first time that I've had Aaron and Hala as my host and also Ambassador Gildenhort in the audience. Uh, so I'm, uh, that doubles the pleasure. And then what triples the pleasure, of course, is the diversity of this panel, um, which is, of course, the Wilson Center tradition, uh, and I'm pleased to be a part of it. <coughs> now, I have come to Washington uh, for a few months a year uh, for the past 10 years, uh, and this time I thought I would indeed find everything changed, uh, a new administration, a new approach, uh, instead, I have seen the Obama administration uh, fall into a few of the same traps that the Bush administration fell into in its first year or so. Um, I see what I think is the same I inability to keep an eye on the really important thing in the Middle East, the same tendency to be distracted by uh, second order issues, uh, the same obsessive fixation on supposedly unfinished business from eight years ago. And let me explain what I mean by that. And this may be counterintuitive because everyone thinks there's just been change. Um, when the Bush administration uh, came into office in 2001, it was chock full of people uh, who still smarted from the accusation that 10 years earlier they had failed to finish off uh, Saddam Hussein when they had a chance. Um, and when they returned to the White House and they came up with the idea for the Iraq war, Israelis came to Washington to warn them uh, that the Middle East had changed. Uh, and the change was this, Iran posed a greater threat than Iraq. In February 2002, the Washington Post ran a story under this headline, Israel emphasizes Iranian threat. Uh, and this is how that piece opened, and I quote it. Uh, As Prime Minister Ariel Sharon arrives today for a White House visit, Israeli officials are redoubling efforts to warn the Bush administration that Iran poses a greater threat than the Iraqi regime of Saddam Hussein, uh, end of quote. At the same time, uh, Natan Sharansky, who was uh, a cabinet minister, said, and I quote him, 
we and the Americans have different priorities. For us, Iran comes first and then Iraq. The Americans see Iraq, then a long pause, and only then Iran, end of quote. That was spring 2002. Uh, now, the Israelis, of course, uh, were right. Uh, Iran should have come first. But because Iran was neglected, Iran became the primary beneficiary of what the United States attempted to do in Iraq. Uh, and because the United States later become, became mired in Iraq, the long pause that Sharansky referenced continues to this very day. Now, the Obama administration is making uh, the same mistake. It, too, is locked in a, a decade-old fixation, uh, the peace that almost was, um, the sword that Bill Clinton almost pulled from the stone uh, at Camp David in 2000. Uh, he waited too long, he ran out of time, and the Democrats were pilloried for the missing peace uh, for years to come. And now they want to redeem themselves uh, by trying it all over again. And again, the Israelis are coming and saying, you're getting distracted by a second order problem, focus on Iran. And it's to no avail. Uh, the Obama administration, like the Bush administration, tells the Israelis that if we do this other thing, why, of course, Iran will be easier. And here is Obama, and I quote, to the extent that we can make peace between the Palestinians and Israelis, then I actually think it strengthens our hand in the international community in dealing with a potential Iranian threat, end of quote. And notice the word potential, as if Iran were not a threat already. Um, this is deja vu all over. Um, Israeli prime ministers show up at the White House pleading about Iran, and presidents tell them, sure, but first let's do this. It'll make it easier to deal with Iran. But in reality, it doesn't. And Iran gains more time, and Iran actually benefits from the failure of the misplaced effort. <coughs> and Israelis begin to wonder whether soon it won't be too late. And given Iran's agenda in the Gulf and beyond, Israelis begin to think that Americans have an attention deficit disorder when it comes to focusing on their own strategic interests. <coughs> so as you'll gather, I actually don't see a lot of difference in the, um, in the approach of the Bush and, and ad Obama administrations except this. I mean, the Democrats must be even more fixated because they're trying to do what they failed to do in 2000 against more difficult odds, more difficult by, I think, an order of magnitude. Um, the two-state solution, I think, is more challenged today than in 2000 because there is a new Middle East. It's just not the new Middle East that the United States had hoped for. Um, now, the least dynamic, I won't say the least, but the least dynamic of these obstacles is the settlements. There are about 260,000 settlers in the West Bank, excluding Jerusalem. About 70,000 are outside the major blocks that everyone assumes would be annexed to Israel in a territorial swap in any final status agreement. It's not a small number. Uh, but this isn't a dramatically different situation than the one faced by the Clinton administration in 2000. Um, the settlements parameter hasn't changed a lot. And in fact, one could argue that with the removal of Israeli settlers from Gaza, um, uh, that dynamic has even uh, uh, improved somewhat. Uh, the real deterioration has been elsewhere. Um, as Ziad alluded to it, I think the first is the dissolution of the Palestinians. I'm not going to belabor the obvious, and Ziad covered it, that the West Bank and Gaza are now under two mutually antagonistic Palestinian factions. This wasn't the case 10 years ago. And it doesn't just raise the question of who speaks for the Palestinians. Uh, it raises the question of who are the Palestinians. Um, are they one people, or are they several peoples? And can their problem uh, be fit into and contained in and resolved by a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza? Now, the impression of one Palestinian people was created by Yasser Arafat. And obviously, uh, the wor world prefers to imagine the Palestinians as a potential nation state, uh, like Israel, to create this very tidy symmetry um, to make the conference resolvable in this Solomonic uh, division of the land. But uh, what if the unity was a false impression, a moment? Uh, what if there are Palestinian peoples in the plural? Uh, one in the West Bank, another in Gaza, still another in Israel, yet another in Jordan, one or more scattered elsewhere, living widely divergent realities and with widely different priorities. Uh, I'm reminded of a story about the late historian Albert Hurani, who wrote a bestseller, which was entitled A History of the Arab Peoples. And someone asked him, why peoples in the plural? Why not the Arab people or the Arab nation? Uh, and Professor Hurani said that he had to be true to history um, and not to a nationalist narrative of history. Now, we know what the nationalist narrative 
of, uh, of the Palestinians says. That the Palestinians are one people with one geography. But what does their history tell us? I think thinking about Palestinian peoples in the plural certainly would explain a lot of paradoxes. Uh, it would explain why the West Bank pretty much shrugged off the Gaza War. It would explain why Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel reject uh, Avigdor Lieberman's idea of drawing the borders of a future Palestinian state so as to include them in it. They would rather remain Israelis, thank you. Uh, it would explain why West Bank Palestinians uh, don't want to assume the responsibility for Palestinian refugees by ins insisting on the right of return of their own ostensible countrymen to another state, the state of Israel. Um, in fact, some of them would prefer to go stateless themselves than assume such a responsibility, and after all, why should they? Uh, as Abbas said to Jackson Deal in that Washington Post interview, life in the West Bank is, as he put it, normal, and we have a good reality. I think that's inaccurate myself. <coughs> but better 70,000 Jewish settlers on the hilltops than the potential liability of having to absorb untold thousands or millions of those other Palestinians from refugee camps in Lebanon or elsewhere. Now, the international uh, community, the Europeans, and the United States want a Palestinian state to solve the Palestinian problem. Now, remember when the international community mandated the creation of the state of Israel, the Jewish state, in 1947, it wasn't to deliver self-determination to a mere 600,000 Jews living in the country. It was to solve the Jewish problem, uh, the problem of the millions of displaced. And I think the same holds true in the international consensus for the Palestinian state. Um, the difficulty is that isn't the state that all Palestinians want. It's often said, I think somewhat misleadingly, that both Palestinians in the West Bank and Israelis favor a two-state solution. And it's misleading because they aren't talking about the same thing necessarily. Uh, some Palestinians only want a state if it won't negate other claims by other Palestinians against Israel. And until then, they prefer to remain stateless. Uh, and Israelis would only accept a Palestinian state if it ends all other claims against Israel. And until then, they're prepared to continue the occupation. Um, now so far, I see no indication that the Obama team uh, understands this. And if they did, I think far from raising expectations, as they have, they'd be lowering them. Uh, first, they'd stop talking nonstop about the two-state solution. Because the perverse fact is the droning on about how a Palestinian state is in the U.S. and Israeli interest has persuaded a lot of Palestinians that it can't possibly be in their own. Uh, I think Netanyahu's refusal to mention it is probably doing more to revalidate it uh, in Palestinian minds than Obama and Hillary Clinton saying Palestinian state half a dozen times daily. And second, they would stop talking about how urgent it all is. Uh, Martin Indyk was interviewed the other day, and he said he was told by one of Obama's close advisors uh, that the president, quote, would like to see a breakthrough not within his first four years, but within his first two years, uh, end of quote. Now, Aaron, I guess, knows best but uh, I think expressions of urgency just raise the asking prices all around. Uh, and it's why Obama's already been rebuffed by Netanyahu on settlements, by Saudi King Abdullah on a normalization gesture, and by Abbas on doing anything. Um, the first inning, I think, you know, we've had three strikeouts. Uh, the other serious deterioration since 2000, of course, is the enhanced capability of Iran to project power into the Israeli-Palestinian theater. And it's not just that the Iranians have contributed to the fragmentation of the Palestinians, by their support for Hamas, they have. It's not just that their support for Hezbollah has fed this whole narrative of resistance. Obviously, it does. It's that this nuclear quest is making Israel rethink the strategic significance of the West Bank. I mean, has anyone noticed, for example, that Israel is spending now a quarter of a billion dollars to build an underground command center in Jerusalem, which essentially duplicates one in the defense ministry in Tel Aviv, which is only 50 minutes away? Why? Because as Ayatollah Rafsanjani reminded us, Israel is vulnerable to a single well-placed nuclear shot on Tel Aviv and the coastal plain, which contain 70 to 80 percent of Israel's economic assets and population. And because Jerusalem is presumably less likely to be attacked by a Muslim nuclear adversary. Uh, if Iran acquires nuclear weapons, uh, Israel would be likely to want to disperse still more strategic, economic, industrial, maybe even demographic assets into widening belts around Jerusalem uh, from every direction. And the purpose would be to persuade any adversary that Israel will remain entirely viable as a state and society even after a nuclear exchange, thus, of course, bolstering Israeli deterrence. Uh, so uh, Obama is exactly wrong about linkage. If progress between Israel and the Palestinians won't make any difference to Iran's nuclear <coughs> quest. 
But if Iran's quest succeeds, it could change the game between Israelis and Palestinians. And in fact, I think Iran's quest is already changing it. It's beginning to create a strategic rationale alongside the ideological and sort of lower level security rationales uh, against the Palestinian state. And once that happens, the Palestinian state is going to drop from the menu until either Iran retreats from its present path or the regime there changes. Uh, so I'll conclude. Um, the Obama administration hasn't broken with the Bush administration. Like its predecessor, it's not zeroing in on the Iranian driver of the negative dynamic in the region. And during the Bush administration, that's why other otherwise valuable things like the liberation of Iraq and free Palestinian elections blew back and enhanced uh, Iran's power and that of the radicals. A and that's why another mistake in this sequencing of U.S. priorities could blow back as well. Uh, President Obama called the nuclear Iran a game changer, uh, and I think perhaps it's time for the United States to change its game too. Thank you, Ben. <coughs> Gentlemen. Great. Thanks very much, Aaron. Um, I'm, my remarks today are going to be um, mostly about Egypt and about <coughs> Egypt's role in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, the peace process, Egypt's relationship with the United States, and how it relates to the Palestinian-Israeli uh, peace process. But before I go there, I just want to say two things in terms of reaction to what I've just heard, if that's okay. I will stick within the 15 minutes, I promise. It's your, it's your time, Ben. <laughs> I understand. Thanks. And the first is I just have to react to um, what Dr. Kramer said with regard to both Iran and the diversity of the Palestinian people and, and calling the Palestinian um, nation, as it were, into question. And I think that the significance of that actually is quite interesting. The first idea that really we should forget about the peace process, we should forget about resolving this conflict, which is really central to um, uh, problems in the Middle East, central to animosity towards the United States for being seen as uh, biased in its support for Israel at the expense of the Palestinian people and so on, is to distract us from trying to address this conflict, which is really not a second order problem. It's not a second order issue. How can you talk about individuals who have been living under occupation for longer than I have been alive and who suffer the daily humiliations, great and small, that President Obama spoke about when he was in Cairo, the 60 years of dislocation as being a second order problem? It is not a second order problem. It is central to uh, feelings in the Middle East and not only the Middle East, it is central to feelings about the United States from Morocco to Malaysia. And it is in our national security interests to address the problem and to solve the problem as much as we can. The second point is this idea that the Palestinian people are so diverse, as it were, that, that then why even have a Palestinian state? That might not actually be uh, what the resolution of this is. Well, that's, that's also, I think, uh, patently absurd, and absurd for the following reasons. All nations, as it were, are tremendously diverse and have tremendously diverse <laughs> individuals in them and groups and have tremendously different diverse ideas about what the nation should be. You think of Israel, for example. Israel has people in it who want uh, a secular state, a thoroughly secular kind of liberal state. It also has people in it who wish Israel to be a very conservative religious state. It has individuals who look at Israel and see its orientation as being Europe and American centric. It has others who look at it and say that e uh, Israel should be more focused as a kind of regional uh, a player and so on. You think of the diversity in this country as well. So the, the point that I'm trying to make is the significance or the work that focusing on Iran and the Palestinian people and the diversity do what the kind of takeaway from that is, is to distract us from the centrality of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, right? And secondly, calls into question whether there should even be a Palestinian state, right? Maybe they aren't a people deserving of a state, and that's just, that's just, that's just silly, right? Okay, uh, my remarks today, uh, you know, are really, I have to say this, are my own perspective, and they're not really the perspective of Egyptians because there isn't a single perspective nor are they the perspective of the Egyptian government or uh, the perspective of different elements of the Egyptian opposition. There are multiple perspectives in Egypt, 
and we can see that even in terms of the reaction to President Obama's speech in Cairo. Okay, Egypt has been, is, and can be important for the Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace process and Arab-Israeli peace for a number of obvious reasons. And obviously, Egypt was the first Arab country to recognize Israel. Uh, President Sadat made the famous speech in the Knesset in 1977. This led to Camp David in 78 and led to the peace between Israel and Egypt in 1979. Egypt is the largest country in the Arab world, the most populous country in the Arab world, the country with the largest army, although maybe not necessarily the most efficient army presently. Uh, it also has a tremendous amount of influence in the region, culturally, ideologically, politically, <laughs> even though that influence has been significantly declining over the last number of decades for all different kinds of reasons. Egypt is also a frontline state and has been at war with Israel five times since 1948, and it has been actively involved in the so-called peace process, quote unquote, as interlocul interlocutor, as facilitator, as host, and as mediator. I no, don't need to remind anybody uh, about Egypt's or the Egyptian government's attempted mediation between different Palestinian factions recently. Of course, this begins in terms of Egypt's role in the peace process uh, at the very, uh, at the latest with Madrid in 1991, but you also know that Sharm el-Sheikh, Taba, and Cairo have been host to Prime Minister Perez in 1996 for a peace conference, Prime Minister Barak in 2000, Prime Minister Sharon in 2005, Prime Minister Olmert in 2007. It's probably the city in the Arab world that Israeli prime ministers have visited most often. Um, and, and this is interesting. Egypt's relationship with the United States is mediated in a way uh, through its role in the peace process and through its relationship and peace treaty with Israel. Camp David, in a way, is central to U.S.-Egyptian relations. Uh, of course, there are other aspects of Egypt's uh, relationship with the United States, whether it's military cooperation, uh, uh, the overflight rights that the U.S. has granted regularly, expedited passage through the Suez Canal for U.S. Uh, military vessels, including nuclear vessels, intelligence sharing, particularly important during the Bush administration's war on terrorism, quote unquote, and so on. And this, this is important. How Egyptian, dip, Egyptian diplomats sometimes will say, um, and I think this is quite accurate, that for them, the road to Washington goes through Tel Aviv. And that is, they understand the significance of Egypt for the United States as being centrally related to Egypt's peace treaty with Israel and Egypt's continuing mediation efforts in terms of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Now, things changed under the Bush administration, and Egypt's value for the United States declined significantly for a couple of different reasons. First, the Bush administration came to power, feeling that the Clinton administration has, had wasted its time, hadn't made any progress with regard to this kind of time immemorial, quote unquote, conflict and so on, and that therefore they are not going to make the same mistakes and not engage intensively in uh, Palestinian-Israeli peace. And therefore Egypt became less central because Egypt is seen as uh, important for that uh, and so on. Egypt also not only became less important under the Bush administration or in Bush administration thinking, after September 11th and the attack on this country by al-Qaeda, of course, there was the idea among many in the Bush administration that the absence of democracy in the Arab world was a problem and leads to terrorism exported to the United States. So Egypt became not only no longer valuable, Egypt became a problem. Egypt became a problem because of the authoritarian character of the regime. President Mubarak has been in power for 27 plus years and there was a focus on the democracy agenda, the freedom agenda, quote unquote, and Egypt became central in terms of the efforts to promote democracy. The National Endowment of Democracy speech on November 6, 2003, uh, the second inaugural address in which President Bush didn't mention Egypt but spoke about democracy promotion and so on, the State of the Union address in February 2005 when President Bush again mentioned Egypt, Condoleezza Rice cancels her trip to Egypt in February 2005 to protest Ayman Noor's imprisonment. She delivers an impassioned speech about democracy in the Middle East and the U.S.'s democracy promotion efforts in the summer of 2005. And Egypt becomes, as I said, a problem, as it were, as opposed to part of the solution. And in fact, relations between Egypt and the United States sour, at least between the regime, and President Mubarak doesn't visit the United States from 2004 until the present. Now, it looks like of course, 
things have changed in Washington to some extent, whether for ill or for good is for you to decide, but with regard to the U.S.'s relationship with Egypt, particularly with regard to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. This administration seems to think, and I think correctly, that the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is central to uh, the kind of instability in the Middle East and hostility towards the United States and so on, and it's making a play for Palestinian-Israeli peace, and it sees Egypt as central to that solution, as it were. And, un, you know, unfortunately, democracy or the focus on democracy and human rights and rule of law will take a secondary role because of this. And we see this, of course, manifested its manifesting itself in the choice of Cairo as a destination for President Obama to d address the Muslim world or Muslims in the world, whatever you prefer, as it were, despite the calls uh, by many uh, that Cairo would be an inappropriate venue precisely because of the authoritarian character of the regime and so on argued in the Washington Post op-ed pages by Saadid Dean Ibrahim and others and so on. Now, let me briefly make three uh, other points in my time. You can please tell me how many minutes I have. Really Thank you very much, Aaron. <laughs> um, <coughs> now, I think it's actually important to focus on what President Obama said when he was speaking on June 4th at Cairo University with regard to the Palestinian issue because I will say that most Egyptians, and of course, as I mentioned, there's a great diversity of, of opinion, most Egyptians, I think most Arabs, in fact, you know, most sane people, I would even say, uh, venture to say, liked a number of different things about the speech. I'm not going to focus on things not related to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I can't remember a sitting president speaking so eloquently about the Palestinians, their suffering with such clarity and credibility while in office as this president has. He talked about, quote, the pain of 60 years of dislocation, unquote. He talked about, quote, the daily humiliations, large and small, that come with occupation, quote, unquote. He used the word occupation to describe the illegal occupation of, uh, of the West Bank. He said, so let there be no doubt the situation for the Palestinian people is intolerable, unquote. He also spoke of Palestine, uh, quote, unquote. So these were things that I think many people in Egypt and elsewhere liked very much, and this is, I think, what the Egyptian regime and what large segments of the Egyptian public want, sincere engagement, fair treatment, and an and effort to exert the necessary pressure on both parties, on the Palestinians and the Israelis, to make peace. Let me also say that peace is in Egypt's interests, quote unquote. And I hate talking about the interests of states as if they were kind of naturally apparent and so on, but let's go on with this for a moment. Let me try to explain why peace is in Egypt's interests and in particularly in the, in the Mubarak regime's interests, in addition to differentiating the Mubarak regime from Egypt as a nation state, from Egypt as a nation state's interests. First, most Egyptians, like others in the Arab world, feel very strongly about the Palestinian cause and are very sympathetic to Palestinian suffering, so much so that one could argue, and I think this is quite accurate, that Palestine is a domestic policy issue in Egypt. It's not a, it's not a foreign issue, foreign policy. It is a domestic policy issue. And before 2003, in fact, I would argue it was the number one domestic policy issue that, in fact, separated and that was a cause of grief for the government because the government's relationship with Israel, its perceived inability to do anything to alleviate Palestinian suffering, the ma maintenance of an, an, an of Egyptian ambassador in Israel, the, the maintenance of an Israeli ambassador in Cairo, and Egypt, the Egyptian regime's uh, perceived um, complacency and, in fact, participation in this, in the suffering, as it were, well, put the government in a difficult position against all segments of the opposition, not just Islamists or, or others and so on. I think most people in Egypt were quite critical of the Egyptian government's position. They were critical with regards to um, uh, the idea of normalization, which is part of you know, uh, a piece that Egypt is supposed to normalize relations fully with Israel, economic, cultural, and so on. As I said, they were also quite critical of the natural gas sales to Israel for all different kinds of reasons. Um, they were critical of the government's perceived complicity in the recent Gaza war, and in fact, the Egyptian government's unwillingness to ease the siege of Gaza, even allowing 
even sometimes blocking the um, delivery of humanitarian supplies into Gaza and so on. Now, all of that being said, I will say also that it's my sense, my feeling, that despite this criticism of the government's position, most Egyptians, uh, the vast majority of Egyptians, do not want to re-engage in war with Israel. Uh, most Egyptians appreciate the benefits, quote unquote, of the uh, Israeli-Egyptian peace. Uh, they realize they're realistic about Egypt's uh, position and its capabilities. They are cognizant of the suffering that Egypt has uh, borne as a result of all of these wars and so on, and they don't want to, you know, tear up the Camp David peace treaty or engage in any kind of military conflict with, with Egypt, uh, with Israel. The last point I want to make, which is a slightly different one, is all of this being said, I think it is important to understand the relationship between the Mubarak regime and Hamas, because this is something that is not necessarily kind of widely understood. Sometimes it's, it's misunderstood. That is that Egypt is not a neutral party or a mediator independent of the conflict that is the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and impartial toward both parties, the Palestinians and Israelis. Egypt is a direct party to the conflict in some ways. Egypt has important national security interests at stake. It wants to see a peaceful northeastern border with Gaza as well as with Israel. It realizes, I think, Israel's military superiority and economic might and so on in the region. It does not want Sinai to be used as a kind of terrorist battleground between Palestinians and Israelis. And as you know, there have been a number of bombings in Taba in Sharm el-Sheikh, in Dahab, and so on, and the Egyptian tourism industry suffers, unfortunately, as a result of this, which is a major component of the, of, of the Egyptian economy. It also does not want to see uh, breaches in its border, as it saw in 2005 after the Israeli withdrawal in September, as it, as it also saw in January of 2008, in which 750,000 Palestinians or Gazans went into Egypt for about 12 days and were, you know, uh, purchasing diapers and other things which they couldn't get in Gaza as a result of the siege. Uh, Egypt does not want to um, host, uh, uh, you know, uh, Palestinian refugees. Now, the Mubarak regime's interests go further than these national security concerns because the Mubarak regime, of course, is an ostensibly secular Arab regime aligned with the United States and aligned with Mahmoud Abbas's pro-U.S. Palestinian Authority with a signed peace treaty with Israel and continuing economic and other dealings with Israel. The Mubarak regime also is a largely unpopular regime, becoming more unpopular as, as every day goes by, which derives no legitimacy from electoral success, <coughs> unlike Hamas, which is a popular resistance movement with electoral legitimacy. And therefore, the Mubarak regime is fundamentally biased in, its, in, in favor of Abbas against Hamas. And I think if we look at the negotiations that have been trying to be mediated by Egypt with regard to Cairo, we hear both Egyptian analysts and occasionally Hamas officials make claims about this, which are not hard to believe. And one wonders then, and I you know, pose this kind of as a, as a question to think out loud, as to not only the credibility of Egypt as a mediator between Hamas and Fatah, but the kind of negative consequences or limitations of Egyptian mediation with regard to Hamas and Fatah because of the Mubarak regime's pro-Fatah uh, position. I will stop there, and I hope I have been within my 15 you minutes. You did really well. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before we go to your questions, I'd like to offer a couple observations, and I, I will be brief. Um, number one, um, my sober reflections aren't grounded uh, in some sort of epiphany. Uh, I woke up one morning and decided that 25 years of pursuing a negotiated solution to the Arab-Israeli conflict now suddenly were meaningless or ineffective and that m my software had changed. My sober reflections are grounded in two basic realities. Number one is I, I've watched over the last 16 years, eight under Bill Clinton, eight under George W. Bush, America fail badly in matters relating to peacemaking and in matters relating to war making. Uh, and if you can't help to make peace and you can't prosecute a discretionary war successfully, 
without cost, great cost, and without gross mismanagement, there's an arguable proposition that you, in effect, are a superpower. And I take, I'm not a declinist, I take American power very seriously. And every time America projects its military and political power abroad and does not succeed, there is a cost, particularly if you are a superpower, and particularly if your will is thwarted and undermined by tinier powers who don't have half of the political and economic and military power that you do, but are able to use asymmetry, asymmetries, to quite effectively pursue their own interests. So that's one point. I do not want to see America <coughs> fail again. I'm not calling for benign neglect on this problem. I'm not calling for withdrawal or retreat. I am calling for a tough, smart, and fair policy designed to actually succeed. Number two. My sober reflections, and in frankly, it is not up to me to make the case as to why a two-state solution is just around the corner. It's not up to me, because reality flies in the face of it. Now, that doesn't mean it's impossible. It doesn't matter that in life, things may, may change. America's not a potted plant, after all. We do have political will. We can change matters. But as I see it now, the factors that are required to pursue quickly and easily and in a purposeful fashion a two-state solution to the conflict right now are not in place. They could be in place, perhaps. Number one is a divided and dysfunctional Israeli government. Uh, the history of peacemaking in Israel is a history of the right wing. It's not a history of the left. Begin, Rabin, transformed, in the case of Rabin, a transformed hawk. Only Ariel Sharon could dismantle set settlements and remove settlers. Uh, it's not that Israel has a right-wing government. That's not the problem. The history of peacemaking in Israel has been dominated by the right wing. The question is whether it has a functional <coughs> right-wing government and whether or not there's a consensus within the Israeli political establishment, forget the public for a minute, as to what price Israel needs to, must, or will pay for this two-state solution. On the Palestinian side, and I think Ziad was, was um, not as expansive as I hoped he would be, you have a divided and dysfunctional Palestinian national movement. I don't know how to address that issue. I don't know how Americans can address that issue. But unless you have an authority which has an effective monopoly over the legitimate forces of violence within Palestinian society, one gun, I don't care if it's Toledo, Chevy Chase, Maryland, where I live, Sweden, Egypt, states are credible. Authoritarian or democratic polities are credible for many reasons. But the sine qua non of credibility is a monopoly over the legitimate forces of violence within your society. If you do not control those, you have no credibility with your constituents, and you will never have the respect of your neighbors. And finally, the regional situation is, is not great with respect to protecting this process. Rarely have I seen a time where the pursuit of Arab-Israeli peace is more exposed to the machinations and power projections of non-state actors functioning in non-states, Hamas and Hezbollah, or Iran. And I don't know whether you have to deal with Iran first or the Arab-Israeli issue. All I know <coughs> is that the process is very vulnerable, very, very vulnerable. Um, finally, one, one, one observation. I have a very, cru and, I, and I'll be very clear and honest here, I have a very cruel and unforgiving standard by which I judge what success in the Arab-Israeli peace process means, because I've watched it now and study it. And process is fine. It really is fine. Process is just another word to describe a problem you can't resolve today. That's what a process is. And a process can be smart. But let, let me be very clear. Success for this administration, if in fact it is interested in actually getting to the end game, either means a breakthrough in an Israeli-Palestinian negotiation and a deal which resolves Jerusalem border security and refugees, 
or an Israeli-Syrian peace treaty, and or an Israeli-Syrian peace treaty. There is nothing short of that that will do. Now, the administration may have other goals short of that. <coughs> and this brings me to my final point, which is on strategy. What is it that the administration is really trying to do? Is it to enhance American credibility? <coughs> is it to create currency with the Arab world as it seeks to deal with Iran? Is it to distance itself from the previous administration and even the previous one before that? Or do they have an actual strategy designed to get Mahmoud Abbas and Benjamin Netanyahu to the negotiating table to sustain a meaningful negotiation and to actually reach an agreement? Because it is by that, whether it's two years or four years, or if Barack Obama gets to be one of the 16 American presidents who were, who were actually elected, but didn't serve out, who were elected to two terms, is that the objective, a two-state solution? I just don't know, which makes this a very curious and fascinating period. So with that, with those reflections in mind, um, why don't we, if there are no ob objections from the, um, my colleagues, go to your questions. And I, I, reaff I just re reiterate the word question. Yes. <laughs> You want to wait for the mic and please introduce yourself. Uh, Mohammed Sina from the Voice of America. Uh, what the Obama administration should do after the Saudi Arabia break remains the issue, position, and reality and nature of the Thank you. We'll take some, some questions and then we'll. Sure, why don't we. Um, um, yeah. Yes. Um. Oh, um, sorry, you know, you're you very important. You have some kids uh, on the issue of study at the University of Vermont. Same or very important, different uh, institution. <coughs> I, it's unusual to have two or such different versions of the reality on one panel. I was wondering, though, given the uh, reception for the moment, the exclusion of the crucial aspect of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for the uh, Middle East uh, and accepting Aaron's uh, version or uh, description of the necessity of w one gun and a monopoly of force. Do, do any of you see at this point the administration being willing to accept Hamas in a uh, government assuming that Hamas is not going to object to a, a peace process? I don't see Hamas uh, uh, recognizing Israel. I think there's a possibility of it uh, not accepting it. If so, how would you see such a mechanism? And just to throw into it, do you see a possibility of Marwan uh, Barghouti being released and taking part in the sp presidential uh, elections scheduled for next uh, year? Thank you, Paul. Let's take one more question, uh, Rafi. Thank you. Uh, Summer provided, a, I'm Rafi Danziger from APAC, and Summer provided some pretty powerful rebuttal to some of the points that Martin made, especially on diversity of the Palestinians and on whether it's a first order or second order uh, issue, and I would very much like to hear Martin's response. Okay, why don't we, uh, Martin, you, would you like to? Uh, yes. Um, number three. Let me take number three, and first maybe just quickly respond to uh, uh, Dr. Shahata, because um, <coughs> um, he may not have thoroughly understood my point. Um, it's not a question of a people deserving of a state. There are actually lots of human groups, <coughs> some with identities, some with national identities, some with their own languages, which don't have states in the world. Um, the map is now very full. 
And um, the question is whether a new state solves a problem. Um, I can give you another example of a cluster of peoples <coughs> who've suffered more than daily humiliations and for more than 60 years, the Kurds. And one has, doesn't have to go far, it's right in the Middle East. Um, or we call them the Kurds. Uh, they have a language or a group of languages. They have an identity. Some may even have a national identity. In northern Iraq, they actually have a national project. That it has all the attributes, no, no fewer of the attributes of a national project than say the Palestinian Authority. But no one supports a Kurdish state. Why? Because it would not solve a problem. It's not that the Kurds say don't deserve it in Iraq. But not only would it not solve a problem, it would exacerbate other problems. So their national identity has to find its expression within the status quo. Right. Um, now, unless a different dynamic takes place among the Palestinians. They will have been curtified by 60 years of very divergent experiences. We can go into why the experiences have diverged and who's responsible for it, but that is history. Um, um, and it's an ironic thing because so many people need a Palestinian state. Even an Israeli prime minister has come forward and said, it was Ehud Olmert, that without a Palestinian state, Israel is finished. Right. So the whole world is keeping open this placeholder and even using the name, as, as Summer indicated, the, the name of Palestine, that's the placeholder for it. But the burden of proof that the state is first of all feasible and second that it will solve a problem is ultimately on the Palestinians themselves. So I raise it as a question. I don't offer an answer. And when I said second order priority, first order priority, I was talking about sequencing. Um, what you have to do first to get, um, to, get um, uh, to, to reach your objective. And I think that here, um, you know, the, the, the whole question of linkage is one which was dealt with much more effectively by an earlier administration. And I don't mean the Bush administration that we just had, but by the first Bush administration. You remember how linkage began. When Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and then came under world pressure, he said, all right, I'll evacuate Kuwait, I'll end my occupation of Kuwait if the Israelis end their occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. Now that put the Bush administration, the first Bush administration in a bind because for all the reasons that Summer indicated, there were many in the Arab world who said, ah, this makes perfect sense. There are probably many at Georgetown somewhere who said the same thing. And what the first President Bush said was, I accept the principle of linkage, but not simultaneous linkage, sequential linkage. Or sometimes it was called deferred linkage. That's the phrase used actually in Avi Schleim's book. And what that meant was, yes, we'll, ha we'll build our regional coalition first, and we'll come to the Arab-Israeli issues. And then there was a not just Israeli-Palestinian, there was a wider issues as well afterwards. That's what made the Madrid conference and all that came from it. Um, it seems to me that this administration, again, has got the sequencing wrong. It wants to go for a regional dynamic without having established the credibility that the first President Bush had. Not only has it not established a credibility, but there are a lot of people in and around the administration and in and around the, 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 the Democratic Party, who said all sorts of things which raise questions in the Middle East. Post-American world, America's diminished stature, you know, we, we no longer have the weight, we can no longer uh, pull the weight that we pulled in the past. Exactly the opposite of the message that the first President Bush radiated after Kuwait. What does that tell us? What does that tell people in the region? It tells them, you know, we better look out for our own interests. Um, so I think there the message is very much uh, off, um, uh, off key. And it may be that this restores dignity, that you know, we're just one among equals and so forth and so on. But at the end, everyone inside, m inside wants there to be American leadership. I think you indicated that as well. It's a crucial thing. And so it's very important for the administration not to undermine whatever master plan it has, and I agree with you, I'm not sure what it is. I mean, it's, it's very hard to, 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 but whatever it is, not to undermine it by, si by simultaneously going about the world and saying, we're not what we were. Because if you say you're not what you were, people aren't going to take you seriously as they took you in the past. Jed, you want to talk about? Yeah, uh, I, I want to talk about so many things, but well, I'll, I'll, right. I'll, I'll limit myself to uh, could what you, you tell could me. Could you talk yes. about, uh, could you try to answer Paul Stamp's yes, question? Yeah, on yeah, well, uh, for, uh, on the, on the, uh, on, on the, the Dan's remark, um, Martin's remark, you know, Martin, you really mounted a, an assault on the very, very concept of Palestinians as, as people who, uh, who 
can have a state meaningfully, and it is in everybody's interest to have a state. You have assaulted the very concept of the land that it is going to be of strategic interest to Israel to preserve and hold on to. You have assaulted the very concept of uh, the Palestinians being able to do it. Well, if you said that it has to solve a problem, I see that you would probably agree amongst a lot of people in this room that the state of Israel solved the Jewish problem. Now what we're calling for is to have a state of Palestine to solve the Palestinian problem. And I think you know, n attacking this very core <coughs> of the potential <coughs> solution is condemning all the Middle East and everybody else to a, to a protracted conflict. And I, I think this is serious enough to warrant this, this reaction. On the issue of the uh, of Paul, uh, you're asking about Hamas, uh, and and I want to link it with the question that Aaron said in, in some form of a criticism about the Palestinians. You know they have to more or less you know be in charge of their own fate and uh, understand you have to have one authority and one gun. There is no question that the. Uh, Palestinian people have to have a unified security system, one gun that serves the political leadership. This is at the core of what the Palestinians are doing right now in, in the West Bank, is to unite the security system under one gun. And I believe the people who have accused the, accused the Palestinians for very long for, for accommodating the lawlessness of the gun holders uh, uh, have to acknowledge that Palestinians have confronted Palestinians in in, in the West Bank in defense of this very concept of a government that is empowered and in charge. This poses the issue of Hamas. Will Hamas be uh, uh, acceptable? Hamas has not been acceptable to Israel or to the United States because the reasons given are, you know, they have to give up violence and they have the, these three stipulations of the, of the quartet. This is a practical problem. Regardless of the, what the Palestinians think, this is a practical problem. You have to have a government that negotiates and not fights with, with Israel to resolve the issue. It's just that simple. For the mere fact that Hamas refuses the very concept of a Palestinian state, which by the way is validated by Netanyahu's reluctance to accept the two-state solution, and he, he needs to understand that he does serve the, the argument for Hamas in that regard. Rejecting a Palestinian, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of negotiations and the border of the state simply does not make Hamas as a party <coughs> to the negotiations. What are we negotiating about? If we're negotiating about the Palestinian state, then the, the borders pretty much are clear, modified, and agreed upon 67 border. If we're starting to talk about Haifa and Yaffa again, well, I, I, I do not think there are too many Israelis who are interested in that conversation. So we're talking about achievable objectives. What you're interested in is something, does it serve the purpose? It does not serve the purpose to have Hamas in its present formation with its rejection of, of uh, giving up arms and rejection of a, of a, of a you know, the recognition of a state of Palestine and six seven border, does not qualify. So what I fear about is that people who are well-intentioned in this country and elsewhere who really want to have the Palestinians get together and kumbaya and you know why don't you just not uh, you know fight with each other are not serving the purpose of establishing the single most important thing to resolve this conflict which is a Palestinian state and by the way that answers the question of dignity there is no people who can have dignity when they're second class citizens or third class citizens anywhere they go in the whole world the Jewish people should teach the rest of the world how they define dignity and I don't think that the Palestinians deserve less than that we have a question from the overflow room from Rossi Allen of the British Embassy. He wants to know <coughs> whether any of the panelists believe that the um, policy of the current Obama administration is to seek a change in the current government of Israel. Um, I, I, I would just offer the following comment to that. I um, toyed with this idea because I couldn't understand <coughs> what, the, what the strategy of the administration was. That is to say, Fighting with the Israelis is a, is a necessary occupational hazard and reality in any serious negotiating process. The three Americans who succeeded, Kissinger, Carter, and Baker, the only three, I might add, all fought with the Israelis. But the fighting was done not out of frustration and not to somehow uh, ingratiate the administration to the Arabs. <coughs> 
the fighting was done in order to achieve a specific objective, which was in fact a breakthrough in the negotiating process, which would cover the president, make the president look good, and actually advance American national interests, but also advance Arab and Israeli interests as well. So there is this notion that since two members of Obama's team, Rahm Emanuel and Hillary Clinton, have both seen the Benjamin Netanyahu movie once before, mm -hmm. 1996 to 1999, that they have in fact counseled him and said, look, we, we can tell you how this is going to come out. And unlike in our previous incarnation with Bill Clinton, we're not going to wait three years to see the end of the movie because we know how it ends. Therefore, and it's sort of by induction, um, don't adopt the same policy that, that uh, President Clinton adopted, which I might add was to work with Netanyahu and to achieve, and the Clinton administration did achieve two agreements. They may not um, accept this logic, and they may be prepared to allow the chips and, in essence, the Israeli government to fall where they may in the event the government will not deliver on what purports to be a comprehensive settlement solution. No one knows this. If you ask them, they would deny it because, of course, the United States never intercedes in Israeli politics, just as the Israelis never intercede in ours. <laughs> we, all know this to, we all know this to be true. Um, so that, that's my response. Um, yes. We'll take another three. Mr. Kramer, you and I recall you alone emphasized the importance <laughs> of Iran's nuclear program. So my question to you is if the only way Israel could get absolute assurance that is in full inspection of and demo demolition if necessary of <laughs> the facilities that Iran has, already has, or is working towards, but that the price for this would be a comparable Israeli abandonment of nuclear weaponry. Is that a price the Israeli government would pay if it had to? Another question. <coughs> well, first, I, I just want to say what a wonderful panel this is and how privileged uh, we are to, to hear it. Um, for uh, Dr. Kramer, um, the, the statements of the Obama administration that seem to place the Israeli-Palestinian uh, issue ahead of Iran uh, I think might be interpreted in a slightly different way. I, I've heard a well-placed person in the administration privately say that there's a very strict time limit on our attempts to, to reach a negotiated solution with Iran. And perhaps part of the, the strategy of the administration to uh, unify the support of the Gulf states, and particularly the Saudis, against the, the Iranian threat is to have the, the Israeli-Palestinian <coughs> Uh, issue placed forward question and for uh, Dr. Shihata um, the um, I, I take your point about um, uh, diversity in Israel and the United States um, but that diversity uh, is within the context of a nation um, it's tolerated because there are all these different uh, strains but they put the nationhood first um, I isn't that a, a, an element that's missing uh, in the Palestinian uh, situation? We have three questions. Um, let's take one more and then we'll divide them up. One, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, man. Yes. Thank you. My name is Maria Stefan. I'm from the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. Um, I guess first a, a question for Dr. Kramer is um, given if you're questioning um, the viability or the existence of, of Palestinian nationhood, would you be willing to contemplate a one-state solution then for Israel-Palestine or whatever it's called, which may or may not be um, the most viable long-term solution for the region? Are you willing to contemplate that? And for Dr. Asali, um, I'm wondering if you would uh, say that a popular uh, Palestinian nonviolent struggle um, against the occupation, um, somewhat like the first intifada, but perhaps with greater strategic thinking and maybe a bit m more nonviolent discipline, if that could be a game changer. Um, is the PLO 
contemplating this or are they relying exclusively <laughs> on negotiations <laughs> to bring about a solution? Thanks. Great, okay. Um, Sam, we'll start with you on the diversity question. Uh, sure, the, the problem with the argument that, or not the problem, but you see, I think what's important is to understand what the narrative is supposed to accomplish when you talk about the diversity of the Palestinian people and so on. The narrative is supposed to accomplish, it justifies in a way, it legitimates the denial of a Palestinian state. And we're not supposed to feel bad about it because they're not a people anyway, right? And I have a very big problem with that. And simply to say that the Kurds also deserve a state or they have a problem or the Tamils also have a problem, or others, that doesn't justify in any way the denial of a Palestinian state for this group of people who want and say they want a state and have been saying so for quite some time. And, and in fact, you know, we're talking about the diversity of the, of the Palestinians. Are they really more diverse than other peoples? Are you simply talking about, you know, some people are, 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 are pro-Hamas and others are pro-Fatah? I mean, is that the extent of diversity that you're talking about? No, that's not, that's not, that doesn't, that doesn't work. And I think it's important to recognize what the narrative, how the narrative functions and what it's supposed to accomplish. The, the, the sequencing argument too, I mean, you know, this, the problem with the sequencing argument is there's gonna be a lot of things we're gonna put ahead of to focus on this issue, right? Okay, we finish Iran, if we ever finish Iran. Then we're probably gonna put democracy in the Arab world there. We're gonna have to deal with that first before we get to the Palestinian-Israeli issue. I'm sorry I'm not willing to wait. This is a central issue. Let's deal with it. With regard, just one last thing, because we didn't actually answer uh, Mr. Right, Shanelli's. I, uh, I felt uh, bad about yeah, that. exactly. Bad. Okay, just very quickly, and that is what the U.S. should do. I am not going to um, address that directly, but what I am going to say, and just remind you, is that the U.S. does have many cards to play, and it does have a tremendous amount of leverage with regard to this special relationship with Israel, right? As you know, Israel is the largest recipient of U.S. aid, despite the fact that Israel has a very high GNP per capita ratio, price purchasing parity, right? I mean, Egypt's uh, GNP per capita and a, and a country of 80 million people is about $5,400 a year compared to the United States, which is in the 40s. Israel, correct me if I'm wrong, their GNP per capita or GNI per capita purchasing price parity must be in the high 20s or 30s, if not higher, it's right? Somewhere Probably, that, okay, but, yeah. but it's a significantly with a country of how many million people? Right. We provide loan guarantees, which are essential for Israel. There's a tremendous amount of intelligence sharing. There's U.S. diplomatic support for Israel, generally and specifically in the U.N. Security Council. Those are F-16 and other U.S. military planes that go over Gaza and bomb uh, U.N. schools and so on. So there's a tremendous amount of potential leverage that the United States could exert if it really wanted to use the full weight of its power to try to exert influence on Israel. Just one last thing, and that is, you know, Aaron mentioned, he, he, quote, you know, he quoted Max Weber, right? Max Weber, the famous German sociologist, has a definition of the state as that institution that has the monopoly of the legitimate use of violence in a given territory. Okay, that's what a nation state is. The, and, and of course, that doesn't exist in, in Palestine. The problem is that the United States has participated or facilitated the disintegration of the Palestinian state by, one, not recognizing the legitimate, the outcome of the legitimate fair and free election that took place on January 26, 2006, that elected a Hamas-dominated Palestinian government. And then secondly, since that time, the United States has been supporting one faction um, in the Palestinians against the others in a number of different ways, including with the supplying of money and arms to Mahmoud Abbas's security forces and allowing them to be trained and so on in, in, Ga in Egypt. And then who knows whether they encouraged or not in some ways, I'm referring to the Gaza bombshell article that appeared in um, Vanity Fair, encouraged the um, beginning of hostilities, let's call it, let's, let's put it that way, in Gaza in the, in the summer of 2007. Okay, Ziad, you want to take the question on nonviolent? Uh yes, I think uh, I think uh, the, the Palestinians do not really have a military option. And by the way, I don't think Israel has a military option 
And so it has to be something else that uh, is used in trying to resolve this conflict. Uh, primarily, I think it has to be a, a, an international political attempt to engage the international community in defining its own interest as uh, it is in the United States' interest to, uh, to pursue this peace and hence lend an incredible amount of recorrection about the imbalance between the occupied and the occupier. The Palestinians have to pursue uh, a, 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 an expression of their dissatisfaction with the occupation and certainly a nonviolent struggle needs to be maintained and continued and expanded. Uh, the, uh, the first intifada brought to the Palestinians a lot m more attention and sympathy and world recognition <laughs> of their problems <laughs> that was really pretty much demolished by the second intifada. And the main difference is, is using arms in, in the second intifada. And I think one of the things that are taking place regularly now, every week, there are peaceful demonstrations around a couple of three villages, Banin, Nalin, in, 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 in Palestine that draws the attention of people from all over the world, especially young people who just go out there to defy the wall and the occupation, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, as I read uh, recently, one of the Israeli uh, uh, military people said it is much easier to fight in Gaza than to go and suppress these people in, in Nalin. Uh, this is taking the high moral ground that was, I'm sure, you know, in a lot of ways dissipated by the Second Intifada, and it is still an option. However, on the issue of the, um, of the Obama administration, uh, I think it is very important to give this administration a chance. I mean, seriously, I, I see you know, too many negative vibes here. We have a, a president who gets the support of very <coughs> serious people in the, in the Congress and, and with stalwarts of Jewish supporters in his White House who are pursuing this policy and in order to deliver, in order to deliver in the foreseeable future. Of course it's hard, it has failed, but I have to say one of the m more important reasons for the previous failure was a political commitment that was lacking in a very serious way by previous administrations. You know, you have the policy but you do not pay the political price. Here we have an administration that is willing to do that, so we need to to, to work with this administration and, and enhance its political clout. Here, hence my call for a national coalition in support of a two-state solution, a national coalition in this country that gives political power, whereby you have major you know, ethnic uh, involvement in it as well as just Lily White uh, 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 you know, and, and others, to lend support to the process that can yield, you know, because you know, administrations do bend to political power, so let's give them more political power. And I'm talking about something we can do as citizens to support what they are going to be doing, you know, in, in, in a regional and in a bilateral context. Martin, your name was invoked many times. <laughs> you want to <laughs> respond? Sure. Uh, there are lots of lots of interesting questions. And maybe just a comment on this question about whether um, the Obama administration is interested in uh, seeing a change in the Israeli government. It would be again one of these ironic continuums, which I've mentioned earlier in my talk with the Bush administration, regime change. Um, um, the difference, of course, between now and the 90s, the lesson of the 90s, is that, of course, the Israeli body politic has, has changed. It's moved right since the year 2000. So this is a riskier proposition than it might have been in, um, sort of in, in during the Clinton administration. Uh, you've got Lieberman in the scene. You don't know exactly what you, you know, you're not necessarily sure that what you'll get what you wish for if you go down this route. So um, um, I think it would, be, um, it would be a bold gamble, not unlike some of the gambles that the Bush administration took if, if, if they tried to do just that. Um, the, the whole nuclear question would be another panel. I don't think we have time to go into all aspects of it. I would only say this. Israel's opposition is not to Iran having a nuclear um, program. It's to this regime in Iran having a nuclear program. Uh, and um, Israel believes that it has behaved responsibly as a nuclear power. And again, I'm not revealing any secrets. I don't know what exactly is the nature of this, uh, but, but Israel believes that it has behaved responsibly. It has not threatened anyone. Um, and it doesn't matter how you translate it, if it's wiped off the map or something else. It hasn't made a threat. And it hasn't had one of its leading figures say, well, we could drop one nuke on our adversaries. Look what it would do. None of this has happened. And this has happened in the case of this regime. So I think that from the Israeli perspective, it's still, I, I, Israel's point of view is that um, 
it has behaved responsibly. It is, among the various other nuclear powers, a responsible um, a, a steward of its nuclear capabilities, which are, which it is, which are doomsday, last resort, uh, not uh, the way in which Iran has – some Iranian leaders and some figures have described their use of, um, of nuclear weapons. So I don't think Israel will be prepared – short the short answer is I don't think Israel was prepared to do this kind of quid pro quo with this regime. Now, um, three, just a comment on, on um, the Gulf. Uh, I think – who asked the question about the Gulf? You did, yes. The interesting thing about the Gulf, um, uh, Gulf attitudes <coughs> – um, and, uh, you know, this is often uh, the, the progress in the Israeli-Palestinian track is presented as being what is necessary to get the Gulf states to move in a concerted way towards an effort to deal with the Iranian issue. The fact is that the Iranians are driving the Gulf uh, leaders in that direction anyway. The latest uh, results of that Telchami poll show already another shift. Uh, as we get further down the line, as, you know, the point of no return seems to loom ever larger, we're getting a shift anyway. So the question is, how much more would this add, and whether a possible failure, as, as, as Aaron indicated, a possible failure in this track might actually have the reverse effects. Might that be a, a, a prime instance in which you want to delay the sequencing um, uh, on a promise that later you will deal with this if we do, if we deal with the, with the Iranian issue first? Um, an another question here, I, I don't want to be misunderstood here <coughs> about, um, I think maybe Ziad misunderstood me. And one of the questions here, I think, also misunderstood me about um, uh, my approach to Palestinian uh, uh, um, statehood, nationhood. There is this progression from identity uh, to national identity, to peoplehood, to nationhood, to statehood. Most human groups, there are thousands of them, have fallen by the wayside at some point in this, in this sequencing, uh, for historical reasons and for other reasons. Um, the Palestinians are perhaps unique in having the world having constructed this sort of fast track, um, a framework, as I say, a placeholder. Um, now, what Israel wants alongside is it is a Palestinian state that solves the Palestinian problem. It doesn't want a Palestinian state that solves the West Bank Gaza problem. Um, if the Israeli public is told that a Palestinian state will solve a, the Palestinian problem, they will support it, and the numbers in the polling show it. Um, but they are told by Hamas and by secular one-staters and by right-of-returners that it won't, that such a state will not solve the Palestinian problem. Um, and, um, and I think that that is um, – that's the crux of it. Israel's message has been this. Until we get that kind of state, we can perpetuate the status quo. Um, and I think that that is really a crucial message because I don't see anything else that can galvanize Palestinian supporters of a Palestinian state than that message. Because if they believe that Israel will somehow tire of the status quo, that Israel at some point will throw up its arms, that Israel will submit to American pressure, that some, some you know, deus ex machina will change everything, we won't get that kind of consolidation. And so that has to be, I think, from Israel's point of view, a consistent message. And there's, there are lots of ironies here. That's why I say also this talk, talk of a two-state solution distances a two-state solution, right? It makes it seem like it's in Israel's and America's interest. I think every time an Israeli prime minister or political leader gets up, uh, Sipi Livini was here and she was doing the same thing, and says, we need nothing more than a Palestinian state. It's in Israel's interest. I can just hear how this is playing among many Palestinians. Of course, I know how it's playing with Hamas. This is an Israeli <coughs> interest. So there are lots of things that maybe should be done and not said. There are perhaps things that should be said and not done. Um, um, but I, I, the present, the, the, the present um, approach, which is a continuation really of the late Bush approach in the previous administration, is broken. How is it? How is it that here we are, after having a U.S. president, an Israeli prime minister, uh, um, and, and countless joining the international chorus in support of a Palestinian state, that the Palestinians have actually taken a step away from it? Hamas has been strengthened. Uh, the one state um, uh, chorus in the academy has grown. Uh, now, there you could offer different explanations, but it really is a paradox. And I have a feeling uh, that as you bring that horizon closer, there's been a Palestinian retreat from it. The whole notion of the political horizon, which has been so crucial. We'll, get the, we'll show the Palestinians what it will look like. They will move towards it. Paradoxically, they stepped, many of them stepped back from it. Um, 
And uh, so this is, I mean, these are, um, so I don't want you to come away and say, you know, Martin Kramer uh, is uh, dead set against the Palestinian state. He made a rationale against it. I'm saying that people understand a Palestinian state different, differently, and there is a kind of Palestinian state which would be acceptable to the vast majority of the Israeli public. I call it the Palestinian state that solves the Palestinian question. There are other kinds of Palestinian states which are not. Hamas state, terror state, irredentist state, state with aggressive claims. These kinds of states are not acceptable. So it isn't just a black and white issue of a Palestinian state, yes or no. It really is a question of what kind of Palestinian state. Let, let me just offer one, one perspective on the Obama administration. Um, in my vein up until now, efforts to sort through exactly where, where it is they're going. And I don't want to become a prisoner of the past, but there's much we can learn from the past. The three successes we've had in, in diplomacy all fit a certain model. The first success was the 70s, where Kissinger um, took advantage of a crisis, a real crisis, the October 73 war to negotiate disengagement agreement. Second success was Jimmy Carter, where Jimmy Carter took advantage of a real opportunity, not a crisis, a real opportunity, a man who emerged against all expectation and rational thinking, Anwar Sadat, to do something that is quite extraordinary. And then finally, the, th the, the, the last and only the last success we've had, which is a sad comment, I might add, was the first Bush administration's t uh, efforts to take advantage of a moment in the wake of the first Persian Gulf War, where the regional furniture was kind of rearranged and to achieve a procedural breakthrough at Madrid. That's it. That was October 91. America has not orchestrated another breakthrough in the Arab-Israeli conflict on its own. The Israeli-Jordanian peace was done by them. We supported it, debt forgiveness, signing ceremony. That was the last breakthrough the United States achieved, October of 91. I would argue to you that the first model is, n is not available. You have a crisis, but it's a crisis that people have accommodated themselves to. Number two, the second model isn't available either because you're not going to have de novo, a heroic Arab or Israeli leader emerge to do what Sadat did or even reciprocate in the way Begin did. That leaves, I would argue, the third and I would argue, unsatisfactory default position, which I suspect, ultimately, the Obama administration is moving toward. And that is outlining, and, and I'm not recommending this. I haven't thought it through. I'm not sure where it would go. But I suspect, if all else fails, the Obama administration will move to a position where it will outline with support of others in the international community, perhaps with consultation, I suspect, with the Israelis and or with the Arabs as well and the Palestinians, its own vision of where this is going to go. And by the way, not vision. It'll be somewhere between a more robust set of parameters and um, somewhere between the uh, Clinton parameters of December of 2000, and um, well, it'll go beyond the Clinton parameters. I suspect that's where we're going with this. Whether or not that will succeed, what impact it will have on the parties, whether America will be perceived to have succeeded or ultimately failed, because in outlining its position, it will not be able to impose or enforce its will the last 16 years should have demonstrated that with a frightening clarity. We can't and we won't. Nor would I argue, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm just making an observation. This is another subject for a, a panel. We do have enormous leverage, but in large part, it's thought experiment leverage because we've never been willing and or able to exercise it. And I doubt, frankly, any administration, particularly this one, a democratic administration, would be in a position or would be inclined to adopt some of the list of steps that Samer identified as potential uses of, of, of leverage. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, that's how I see it. We have, some, we have time for a, a, a few more questions. Ambassador Gildenhorn. Yeah, 
just thinking out loud. Um, I guess to Dr. Kramer and to Aaron, um, does the Jewish community in the United States still play a major role? Uh, their influence on Congress, uh, if there's a conflict between Bibi Netanyahu and uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, where 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 will the uh, where will Congress come out on the on this issue? Um, curious, uh, Aaron. In the previous meetings, you've said that there's a com very strong link between the United States and Israel, which will not be broken. I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are on this. The influence. Okay. Um, Holly, if you. Um, Martin, mm -hmm. you mentioned Iran, you know, and uh, for 30 years, the, ex the expectation in Israel and maybe in other countries was that there is going to be a regime change. There hasn't been a regime change in Iran, and these, these people are going uh, to stay. Isolating Iran has not worked. Sanctions have not worked. So what is wrong with giving, engaging Iran a chance? You know, and <coughs> what, can you talk a little bit about Iran's role and Iran's influence on the Hamas? You know, I mean, how big is it? How important is it? How crucial is it? And if there <coughs> is a peace between, and this is a question posed to all four of you, if there is a peace between Israel and uh, Syria, wouldn't that automatically undermine the role of Iran? Thank you. All right, we have two questioners and four questions. Ziad, <laughs> Ziad do you? Do you want to start yeah. with uh, Iran yeah. and uh, Hamas? Yeah. On, 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 on the Obama policy, just your point, I think it is heading towards, I think we have an indication of the kind of uh, international coalition that uh, Obama is creating in the region, within the region, and, and, and in, in, in Europe at least, in order to promote this. And you will have this translated into mechanisms that we'll hear about after Senator Mitchell comes back on the policy is is declared, at least in some fashion declared within a few weeks. On, on Iran and Hamas, Hamas and Iran have a very interesting uh, relation. Hamas, of course, is a Muslim Brotherhood uh, organization. It's, a, it's the Palestinian version of the Muslim Brotherhood based in Egypt. It's a Sunni Muslim uh, organization, as you well know, and it has had its roots in providing charity work in Gaza in the first place that eventually was helped by the Israeli government in order to confront the PLO and Yasser Arafat and with time, in due time, like many Islamic uh, movements have done, it has taken a strictly very strident and anti-Israeli, anti-Western attitude which is now what it has in common with Iran. Uh, historically, the rift you know, the between the Shiites and the Sunnis has found many ways to be ameliorated over the past centuries, uh, but uh, but now it is it is making some kind of a resurgence, and the relation between Hamas in particular and uh, Iran it runs against the grain because Iran's real allies in the region are 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 the Shiites, be they in in uh, Lebanon, Hezbollah, or their influence uh, in in uh, the Shiites in Saudi Arabia, within Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, et cetera, in the various regions. Hamas had found the door shut completely against it after it won the elections, and it had no benefactors. There were no Arabs who dared actually give it any kind of support, so Iran grabbed the opportunity to adopt it and fund it, and being desperate and really wanting to rule at any cost, they, they accepted the Iranian patronage. Now they are dependent on the Iranian patronage. In fact, it, they're being stationed in, e in, in, in Syria is a very interesting observation. Syria, of course, is still, at least as far as we know, still in, uh, uh, close to Iran, although it's trying to mend fences, but it does give it physical and geographic uh, home. Uh, the, the power on decision making in Hamas has been contested, but it is clear that it is still very much close to Iran, and that is one of the reasons that we very much object to this insistence on Palestinian unity, 
uh, uh, as a precondition for negotiations because that means outside forces, including Syria and Iran and everybody else, would just simply not make negotiations possible. So you're saying then let's not negotiate. And, and that's why I think it is very important to negotiate, subject the result to a referendum or elections, and then have the people decide whether they support the outcome of negotiation. Martin and Brown in diplomacy. Uh, well, I, um, I think that um, certainly in Israel there's a realization that um, engagement is the policy, and there's a hope that it will succeed. Uh, who, who more has an interest in the success of of the, the engagement policy than, um, um, than Israel and the other parties in the region. Um, but of course the concern is, what's the time frame for this? Because there's skepticism. Even though there's a hope that it will succeed, there's a real skepticism as to whether it will or not. Um, and um, so I think that the issue of the timing is crucial. Now I want to I want to say that I, c I could be wrong here about the reason for which the Obama administration has done the sequencing like it's done it. It may well assume that two years from now they will be on Iran 24-7 because the clock will have ticked. They will have seen that engagement will have succeeded or failed. If it failed, they'll have to deal with it. And so this is their window of opportunity to deal with this issue. And it's not because it's the first and foremost. It's just because of the way in which the different timetables are laid out. This is where the emphasis will have to be. I'd like to think that was true. But I found time and again that when I've sort of attributed sort of grand strategic visions to administrations, it's turned out that's not what's driven them at all. It's been something else altogether. It can be politics. It could be um, historical memory of what worked in the past. It could be analogies, which could be completely baseless. So, um, um, so I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong on this score, uh, but only time will tell. And then you'll have to invite me back, and, and we'll see. Um, Ambassador Gildenhorn asked a very interesting question. Um, but it goes deeper than, than the formula of whether it's, uh, um, the American Jewry still has sort of the clout that it had before. Um, it goes to the whole question of what is, what is the nature of this bond which Obama referenced in his speech. Now I thought it very telling that in his speech he said that this was cultural and historical. When I read cultural and historical I say, well, not entirely rational <laughs> and because it's not strategic. And this has always been what was understood to be at the core of the relationship. That's certainly how I understood it. I wrote an article called The American Interest, which was published in Azul, in which I explained why um, the United States and Israel had drawn so close. There was an interesting dynamic at work after 67 when Israel proved its prowess. The United States realized that by its support of Israel, it could leverage Israel's neighbors into coming into the American, <coughs> Pax, into the Pax Americana, and they did. Uh, and so America doesn't have to deploy troops in the Levant to keep it stable. Because it doesn't have an Israel equivalent in the Gulf, it's constantly deploying and waging wars there. Um, but I think that in this transition, that perspective has been lost. And because I'm not a great believer in the Israeli, Israel lobby uh, concept, uh, I don't think that if that is eroded, there's anything that American Jews can do to stop it. Um, and if it is eroded, it's going to be, a, 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 um, it, it will complicate, it will, it, it will, I think, begin really what the post-American era in the Middle East, because it is the sense in the Arab world that that relationship is firm and unshakable, and Obama used that word too, I think, at some point, which is good, that underpins order in the Levant. Um, and without that, um, uh, we, we are in, indeed, a new, a new game. That would be no less than Iranian nuclear weapons, a game changer for the Middle East. I, I have a somewhat different interpretation, and I guess this probably had to be the final comment. Um, we have a special relationship with the State of Israel. It exists independently uh, and quite separate from our strategic interests. I've never bought the argument, and don't buy it today, <coughs> that because we exercise with the Israelis pre-positioned military equipment, their share intelligence, that somehow Israel is a strategic ally in the same sense that we regarded Panama, North Korea, the Philippines as strategic allies. Look, look, look at these states, uh, even South Korea, if you want a bond with a superpower, the best bond is not the quote unquote hardcore strategic interest. It is in essence the value affinity which links the two countries. I think that is clear. I would, I've argued elsewhere that the debate in America between Israel supporters and detractors on the issue of the special relationship is over, it's done. It exists in the universities and in a few other pockets, but it's essentially over. My problem 
is that this special relationship in the course of the last 16 years, eight under Bill Clinton and eight under George W. Bush, has become exclusive. And be its exclusivity, the fact that we don't call out the Israelis on practices that we don't like, that we coordinate everything with them in advance, even if it has nothing to do with their legitimate security interests, and that we base our point of departure in negotiation on Israeli position, not on what ultimately <coughs> will be in the best interest of the deal, which was essentially what, what we did at Camp David 2000, that we move the special relationship, where I, which I argue gives us extraordinary leverage. Forget our moral and national interest values in supporting like-minded society. Our phone would not ring at all if we didn't have the kind of intimacy with, with the Israelis that we have. It is because of our intimacy that we are perceived to have leverage. Sadat got it, Arafat got it, Hussein got it. It's the paradox of the partial mediator. The paradox of the partial mediator. That is the secret story of the us israeli relationship. When we use that relationship wisely, and I would argue to you, since I participated in both Clinton and Bush, 43, we didn't use it wisely. So maybe what Obama is doing is, I hope so, is re-injecting some of the balance back. But the notion, I have a notion in my book called the cosmic oive, which argues that, that mo many American Jews can't uh, understand this. Everything is a crisis which is elevated to a level of existential significance and importance. When the Israelis adopt this, I get it, I understand it. But when American Jews do it, I don't. And I've written elsewhere that Jews worry for a living, their history impels them to do so. But worrying about the US-Israeli relationship and how America is gonna sacrifice Israel on the altar of its own narrowly defined interests just isn't rooted in reality and never has been. But I want to thank our panelists for, I, I think, a phenomenal discussion and thank all of you for coming. Thank you.